for me, my legacy is you know, working on something like Rowan Coat that's going to be around and hopefully will be around two, three hundred years when I'm six feet under. Um, and hopefully my name will be somewhere still connected with that, you know. Welcome to the Lush Life Podcast. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, and I bring you the how-to guide for living life one cocktail at a time. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by cocktails ever since. Together, we'll learn from bartenders, brand ambassadors, distillers, and others why certain drinks are popular in certain cultures, how to make the perfect old-fashioned, when to shake and when to stir, and so much more. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let the fun begin. Do you love Lush Life Podcast but don't know how to show it? Nominate us for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award, the Oscars of the drinks industry. They have a new entry for Best Broadcast, Online Video Series, or Podcast. Perfect. All you have to do is go to talesofthecocktail.org backslash events backslash spirited dash awards or check out the link on my homepage. Fill in the form and voila! So easy and so appreciated. Thank you for your support. Now, on to our next guest who was born for the role of brand ambassador with his love of the chat, his eagerness to teach, and his lively and generous spirit. I finally pinned down my friend, Peter O'Connor, the European brand ambassador for the Irish whiskey Rowan Co., and got him to start at the very beginning. So I'm from I'm from Dublin, born and bred in Dublin. Um, grew up in a small area outside of Dublin city centre called Talla. Um, now that small area is not basically another city. Um, it's just grown or built up over the last twenty or thirty years. Um, so I still live in Dublin, but now I live in a place called Lucan, which is on the the west of of Dublin city. So what was your? I guess this is a silly question to ask <laughs> someone who's Irish, but what was your your? you know your first taste of hospitality yeah so um i never planned to be in the hospitality industry really um my i'm the youngest of five children and my sister sorry my two sisters and my brother went to catering college in port rush which is in the north um so my eldest brother he came out of college and started working in restaurants and bars i'm eight years younger than him so by the time i was like 14 15 um during the summer and holidays he got me a part-time job as a lounge boy um, so I just did that for a bit of cash, basically. Okay, what is a lounge boy? So lounge boy is like um, like a glass collector, basically, a server on the floor. Um, so at 15, 16 years of age, I was being paid cash in hand. Back then, you were, it was okay. Um, there was no real, uh, how to say, laws around it. Um, and it was only part-time. It was maybe six, seven hours in the weekend. But it was fun, and I really enjoyed it. And then when I was coming into my final year in school, my parents wanted me to go to college, of course, and they're like, so what are you going to do? Will you go into computers? Will you go into accountancy or whatever? And I, n- I never saw myself sitting behind a desk. So I said, I want to be a bartender. And they said, absolutely no way. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then I went into bartending kind of full time during college. And I did business studies, bar management in college. So focus on business, but with a, another focus on actually running bars and bar operations. I absolutely loved it and um, came highest in my class uh, for the two years that we did the course and then I got a job in a very cool cocktail bar one of the only cocktail bars at the time in Dublin called Nancy Hans at 19 and that's really where I fell in love with the, the hospitality industry now why I said that at the beginning about it's a funny thing to ask an yeah. Irishman that because the, don't they say there are more pubs in Dublin than in anywhere else per capita <laughs> there is yeah by and far yeah. so was that pub going culture part of your life when you were young no not really uh because my my both my parents um never drank so my yeah my father was a pioneer never touched a drop of drink we we grew up we didn't sorry we didn't grow grow up in pubs um we were never taken to pubs as as kids unless on summer holidays and we brought in for a coke or a a seven up and a pack of crisps so we never had that pub culture 
but the one thing my father was great at and my mother was talking and you're you know you used to have friends around and it was just cups of tea and it was just storytelling and chatting um, and as kids we grew up like that so I suppose that had a massive impact on me um, I just love being around people and, and talking to people. But the lounge boy job, I assume you didn't really get to talk to people. Oh, you did. You yeah, did. yeah. It was a swanky wee pub. It was called Ashton's um, in Dublin City, just outside Dublin City, actually. Um, so it was, yeah, it was kind of swanky at the time. And um, so I was making, at 16 years of age, I was making probably £100, Irish pounds, um, over the course of a weekend on tips because these the, the customers in there had a little bit of cash. And because I was chatting to them all the time, I'd get more tips. So, you know, the, the money was playing a part, but I just loved, I used to be on a, on a buzz and a high coming out because I never touched a drink until I was 18. Um, so I never, the drink part wasn't a big thing until I went in and started making cocktails into Nancy Hans and that's where I really fell in love. I was like, this is fun. You know, I can make different drinks to suit different people's palates and, and different people's, you know, wants and needs. Um, so it, I suppose it was a combination of everything, but the cocktail part of it really came into play when I was about 19. Well, and, no wonder they were so horrified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, they wanted cat count and see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Folks, but, um, yeah. Did my, they ever come into the pub that you worked they in? They used to, yeah, right. they used to. Um, and, you know... I suppose my father never drank but he used to love especially when I was in um, I know we're going to get onto it when yeah. I was in America he was so proud you know that I started as a lounge boy and ended up working as a master of whiskey in New York and New Jersey so for me that was that was brilliant to have my father and mother proud of me for doing something that I was very passionate about um, and that was the main thing for me it was something that I loved I could never do a job that I don't love you know and we always say if you, if you love your job you never work a day in your life and that's the way I feel so you found yourself in this place, Nancy Hans. Hans. Yeah. And was that the first time you started making cocktails? Yes. Yeah, so not, well, I kind of dabbled a little bit. I remember the very first cocktail I made was when I was 17, 18 in a bar called Madden's North L Street. And this just a guy came in with a son and he asked me to make a cocktail for a son. Um, his son was only a young lad, like a, a non-alcoholic cocktail, of course. And I thought at first he was talking about cocktail sausages. And I'm like, yeah, honestly, Susan, I, I, I didn't realize that he wanted like a non-alcoholic cocktail. So, um, are we okay with that? So, um, yeah, I, I said, okay, no problem. He explained to me. So I put in a few juices into we had one shaker behind the bar. That was it. It was a pub pub. It wasn't a cocktail bar. So I threw in a few juices and whatever I had there. And then I put in a bottle of soda water, <clears throat> closed the shaker and I started shaking it. And of course the thing oh, well, exploded yeah. on me. But I learned never to put um, carbonated drinks into a shaker. So technically that was the first. But Nancy Hans, um, if you look back in kind of 15, 18 years ago, Nancy Hans was renowned as one of the um, bars in Europe that had the most spirits. So we had over 3,000 bottles of spirits. Yeah. Oh boy. It was, the owner was a gentleman called Martin McCaffrey. And um, the manager at the time was James Langan, still a very good friend of mine. And we used to collect... Um, and I actually documented every single bottle. It took me over three weeks to do it, from country to brand, uh, I suppose categories so of vodka, gin, whatever, uh, bottle ABV, and I think it was, yeah, name of the brand. And I had it on a floppy disk, the old floppy disks. Um, yeah, and that, that's really where my passion for spirits came in, because I was like, all these different brands, they all have different flavors. Um, for whisk, someone just starting, that must have been, yeah, you know, like blowing. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I was. You know, all of a sudden you can try anything. Yeah. Were they quite um, nice they to you? Were. To, yeah, you know, did they let you try things? They were because I was making the cocktail menu, so we would create a very at this stage again. I'm talking. I'm 38 now, and I was I celebrated my 21st birthday. So you're talking 17, 18 years there. Uh, sorry, years ago. Um, at the time, the cocktails were. Blue Lagoons, um, Pina Coladas, Mudslides, you know, but I was doing little different things with them. And that's why we became very popular in Nancy Hans. We were putting out probably about on a weekend or over the course of a week, we probably put out about 300 cocktails a week, which is very, very decent for Ireland, uh, for, for Dublin, you know. No other bar was doing that. So I suppose that's what established my name <clears throat> at first in the industry as a young bartender. And um, people took notice of me and then I, I moved on and progressed up the line to different cocktail bars. And I, started, of course, ran um, one of the top cocktail bars in Europe at the time as well. Now, so, when you were there at the beginning, were there any cocktail competitions then? There was. I represented Ireland in Russia. Um, in 2002 or 2003, I can't remember, um, in the World Flair Cocktail Competition. 
So I used to dabble in flair. So you were a flair. I dabbled. I dabbled. <laughs> I wouldn't say I was very good. I enjoyed it. It was part of my trade. Um, but when I went to Russia, it was a bit of an eye opener because you've guys from you know Czech Republic and from Denmark, and they're like circus act, and I'm trying to juggle three bottles. And these guys have six bottles in their hands. So yeah, I soon moved away from, from flaring, but it was an eye opener. I used to compete in a lot of competitions in Ireland. Um, Ireland non flare I non flare non flare yeah, classic. Um, through the bartenders association. And another, but at that stage, cocktails were tiny. Um, it was usually a spirit, um, a liqueur, a juice, and a soda. You know, we, we hadn't got the knowledge of cocktails, so I was trying to learn through books. We hadn't got the internet, of course, we hadn't got social media. So, everything that we learned as Barton, and there was a group of us about five or six of us who Barton is, I'm still very good friends with. And we taught each other. So if I figured out something or I, you know, created something, of course I'd tell them the next time I met or they'd come into my bar and into Nancy Hans and we'd, we'd make the drink together. But it was quite basic, you know. Like fire was a big thing for us. We thought, wow, you know. So, <laughs> Were there any books that really made an impression on you that you remember? Um, the, well, I remember... Uh, Difford's Guide and Simon Difford was I think it was like first or second I still have most of his editions and his first or second edition was the first time I saw it and I thought this was wow and I remember going through all the cocktails and I actually submitted some cocktails to him um, over the years but never made it into the books which wasn't a big deal um, but it was it was kind of that was the first introduction because again we didn't have the cocktail knowledge or the cocktail culture we do today so all the old school cocktail books that we have today um, and they were around back then but we didn't know about it because there was no one there to teach us you know so we were trying and the internet wasn't there either so you're trying to kind of pull pieces from everywhere to, to make yourself better and to grow yourself you know was there a moment when you thought this is it I know I'm in the right place <clears throat> the right time doing exactly what I want or yeah. have you felt that all along I kind of felt that all along um but yeah, there is a time and it always stands out in my mind and it was um, when I was in Australia I took a year off and went to Australia for a year and I got a job in um, just outside Sydney in, in um, geez, what's it called Bondi Junction and a bar called Tea Gardens and Tea Gardens is a very backpacker bar beers schooners blah blah but upstairs he had a bar called a circuit bar and it was cocktails so I went in there with my knowledge and Anthony uh, Chude was the manager or sorry the owner an operator and I used to run workshops on my days off for all the other staff just giving them basic knowledge of cocktails because it wasn't a cocktail bar and he used to come up to me every week with a case of VB which is a, a local beer over there uh, 20, 24 bottles of VB and that was my present um, for teaching his bartenders and he always said to me he goes for a, for a backpacker trying to make ends meet he said you have such a passion for your trade because you're teaching people on your day off I was like well I'm getting a free case of VB for it <laughs> but yeah I always had this passion to share my knowledge um, I I never I never understood bartenders that would actually hold their knowledge to themselves um, and not share it. You know, this industry is, is massive and we're, we're one family in a way. Like I can go to many countries around the world and know someone or know someone that knows someone within the industry and they look after me. Um, so I always feel like if you know something or have, um, I don't know how to say, have a better way of doing something, you should share it through social media or through word of mouth or whatever. Um, and that's what I was doing in Australia. And I can't, Anthony saying that to me that I was very passionate really s struck me and go do you know what I am this is this is my chosen career you know um, and I suppose that was the first time I really became a brand ambassador even though I wasn't one because I was teaching I was sharing my knowledge yeah. what, well you said that you left to go to Australia yeah. um, did you just feel like you wanted to see <clears throat> the world or learn co about cocktails somewhere else what yeah, was it was it was um at the time i was running our assistant manager in a bar called pembroke in dublin so it was 23 i was, it was around 2003 yeah. and um i was in the assistant manager i was in the office one day it was a saturday and this area where we were based was a financial area so saturdays were very quiet for us so i was down doing the week's cash and writing up the cash sheets my brother rang me um the, not my eldest brother but the one uh, the, uh, sorry not my eldest brother but the one next to me and he rang me and he was like listen I've just booked uh, flights um, to Asia Southeast Asia and to Thailand with Paul Kirby another friend of ours he said do you want to come and I was like when are you going they're like in three weeks time we're taking a year off and I kind of knew this was coming up so I said do you know what I said give me give me an hour or so and I talked to the general manager still a very good friend of mine um, and he's like do it he said just do it so packed up everything rang mum and dad and I said listen I'm off with Mark and they're like good um, not good but you know <laughs> yeah. we're happy you're Have going you with your brother yeah and, and not on your own um, yeah and we went to Asia and I learned so much and that's when I came back to Ireland after that trip 
I took over a bar called the Morgan, and the Morgan Hotel is city centre, Dublin, um, sorry, Temple Bar, um, in the middle of Dublin. And it was a cocktail bar run by a really nice guy, or a really good bartender called Roden Rogerson, who owns a few bars now in Dublin. They were doing about probably three, four hundred cocktails a week, which was excellent at the time. Um, but I took it over, and within three years of me being there and, and setting up a brand new bar team, and we just wanted it. I took my knowledge of what I'd learned in Asia and, and Australia and implemented it. So I changed the menu into this really cool, um, fresh, I suppose, fresh fruit, fresh style cocktail menu. So we didn't use any juices or syrups or anything like that. While in Dublin at the time, everybody was using modern syrups. So I just went away from that and I took the real fresh ingredients, that, you know, ginger and, and ingredients that nobody was using. Um, and we went from doing about, you know, five, six hundred cocktails. We went up to an average of about 2,000 cocktails a week. We became the biggest sales of Kettle One Vodka in the whole of Europe um, this bar did so it was that was my you know, that was kind of the height of my career as a bartender and that's how I transitioned into uh, being a brand ambassador for Diageo so after three years I'm sure the Kettle One people loved you they did <laughs> so, so this is before Diageo actually partnered with Kettle One um, so there was a company called Brinkman Beverages has gone now and they were distributing Kettle One in um, in Ireland and we were doing an average about 14 to 16 cases of Kettle a week which was Great, like kettle was the, the spirit of the time. Gin is pretty big now. Back then, you might do a case of gin a week. Yeah. Kettle, or, sorry, vodka was the the spirit of choice. But yeah, we um we became the number one kettle account in the whole of Europe, and that's I like I was brought over to No Let Distillery Ski Dam, <clears throat> maybe three or four times prior to the Agio partnered with them, and then when the Agio partnered with them, um, the held the Agio held their um. I suppose sales briefing in the penthouse for all the senior members of the Azure Ireland just kind of plan out what they're going to do with Kettle my sales rep at the time asked me would I make some cocktails um, after the meeting which I did in the penthouse and I was able that's to that's a lot of pressure um, <laughs> it didn't bother me like for me the Azure was just another company um, you had the head of who's now the, John Kennedy who's the head of um, Europe he was the head of Ireland at the time and he was there and I made some drinks for them told him everything about Kettle One. I did the bottle pitch and the history of Kettle and uh, because I knew everything about it. I worked on the brand, worked with the brand for three years and they were all sitting there going, we have no idea about this brand. So about a week or two later, um, a gentleman called Emmett O'Brien from the Azure came in to the Morgan, offered me a job. He's like, we'd love you to be the brand ambassador for the Azure. We don't have one. We never did because in Ireland it's all beer focused. It's Guinness and Smithix and now Hop House, but it's not spirits at all. So this was a big and a new venture for them. So they asked me, would I be interested? And I just said, no. I said, this is my love is here and in, in working behind the bar. Uh, I don't want to work for a company. About a week or two later, I, I thought about it, kind of stuck in my head, and I was like, you know, I'm finishing work at five o'clock. I was, 20, I was 27, 28 years of age, 10 years ago. And um, That's five o'clock in the morning? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, like most, well, not most now, but you're talking Wednesday, Wednesday to Saturday, you know, at least four or five o'clock in the morning, you're getting out. Um, now I loved it. It was, it was my job. Um, but yeah, I kind of thought about it. And then Emmett came in again a few days or a few weeks afterwards. And he asked me again, would I be interested in taking on the job? So I said, yeah. I said, you know what, I'll give it a shot. And that's where I got into the Azure. That's how I got into the Azure, yeah, was through that. So, and so, but you stuck with Kettle One. You were Mr. Vodka for a while. I was not just vodka. So I yeah. launched... Um, at the time we were launching or the Azure was launching Inspired Luxury which is now world class um, cocktail competition so I kind of was the face of that headed up that um, I worked on Smirnoff I worked in Kettle I worked on Captain Morgan I worked in All Spirits um, because there was only one of me in the whole of the country so you had the reps bringing me going I want to do a cocktail menu in Jack Ryan's bar for example down in Kerry so they're not a Kettle account they might be a Smirnoff account so I'd go down and create a menu on the basis of what their staff's ability was on ingredients that they had they can work with I'd do out a bar design you know so I probably trained in two years that I was there I'd estimate anywhere between 250 I was going to say it must have been crazy if you were only one yeah. in Ireland I was on the road with a lot of bars a <laughs> lot of bars and yet everybody wanted because it was the it was the kick off like I was doing we were doing I should say in Dublin and it was only a small amount of bars at the time we were doing with some really cool cocktails in the Morgan and other bars around um, the, it was the mojito and the cocktail Cosmo craze, you know. I say we did about, as I say, about 1,500, 2,000 cocktails a week. I would estimate that a thousand, maybe a thousand four hundred of them were split between Cosmos and Mojitos, and then the rest were 
bits and pieces. No wonder you liked creating other menus for people. Yeah, it was to fun. just stop making yeah. <laughs> Cosmos and Mojitos. But everybody was, you know, every bar yeah. wanted a Cosmo and a Mojito. Yeah. yeah, it was just that craze that happened. And um, so yeah, I worked on that, and I worked on the this um, Smirnoff Mojito machine as well. You know, to create this slush, slush puppy Mojito, which. Yeah, it was okay. It served a purpose in nightclubs, but it wasn't, you know, I always wanted to make it from scratch. Um, so I did a lot in two years with them, and it was, I enjoyed it. I really did. And then I got offered to go to America and become, because part of that journey, um, as part of my training, I, they asked me, you know, what would I like to do? What would I like to get out of the Azure as well? Because that's one thing the Azure are really, really good at, is progressing you. So it's not all about just you working for them. It's how they can work for you and help you. And we have Bush, or we had, sorry, Bushmills Distillery at the time. Um, and my passion was always about whiskey. And the way I always looked at whiskey, um, and I wasn't a big whiskey drinking back then, but I just loved the history and the heritage um, of whiskey because, you know, unfortunately the Scots think they created whiskey, <laughs> but they didn't. It was Ireland. Um, sorry, guys. But, um, yeah, we, you know, I always looked at, you know, the industry or the spirits industry of having five main base spirits, and then five main base spirits of vodka, gin, rum, tequila, and whiskey. And for them, you can make in the morning, bottle in the afternoon, and sell in the evening. Yeah. Whiskey takes three years. It sits in wood, it matures, it ages, it, it grows a character. Um, so I asked the agent, could I be you know, based up in Bushmills uh, once a month for four or five days, which they did. They allowed me to go up and I used to stay in Bushmills or in Port Rush, whichever, and I'd work in the distillery. So I usually tag along with uh, Daryl McNally, who was the distillery manager at the time. And it wasn't like I was specifically working on, say, the, the mall things or whatever. It was it was an overview. So I basically got to know everything from working with Cooper at the time um, to the aging warehouses, to the guys who worked there, um, every part of the business. And I just loved whiskey. And I just... What a was, great education. It was, yeah. And then he sent me over to um, Cameron Brake as well. So I got to see some of the Scottish distilleries. And I just... I, it was it was the next level to where I was. So I knew about spirits, I knew about cocktails, but to have this insight into how actually these spirits are made and crafted by brilliant uh, master blenders, brilliant master um, distillers, that took me to a new level. And that's when I was offered the job to move over to the US and become one of the masters of whiskey for the ISO. And of course I accepted. You know? Of course. <laughs> yeah. And so how long were you in the US doing it? Four years um, from... I, joined or sorry I moved over in um, 2010 and I moved back to Ireland in 2014 so it was three years and eight or nine months so just just under the four year mark. but it was an absolutely amazing experience you know <coughs> excuse me I remember landing in New York and it was um, the 10th of December or the, sorry the 12th of December 2010 and it was snow maybe yeah. two foot deep um, and I had all my belongings and bags and standing in New York airport, JFK airport and I was like, what am I doing? Where am I going? I had no contact, I had nothing I'd left everything behind me um, but you just have to get on with it and I did, I got on with it and you know, that was a Sunday the Monday I started work um, on the Wednesday I hired a car by that weekend I was driving up to Boston on a different side of the road and whatever, you know, it was just, you yeah, have to get on with it, you know, and I became, yeah, I just became used to it, and within a few months, I took over, not just New Jersey, but New York, I was doing some amazing, um, so Master of Whiskey is not just for the bartenders, we do a lot of consumer events, we work with bartenders, we develop new brands for within Diageo, um, so we're like, we're used on many, many different levels, and that's what I loved about that role, it was like, it's not just events, or it's not just brand passion tastings it's you know you're used by some really important people like Tom Bullet um, on development of Bullet Rye or Bullet 10 year old so you're involved in, in quite a few cool things being a master of whiskey so that must have been <coughs> such a fantastic experience I'm surprised that anything pulled you away from it especially some a country <laughs> as big so what brought you back to Rowan Co yeah I, um, I suppose if you take a step back and like after three years of being on the road in the US um, I said to you earlier before we you know we we're having a cup of tea there I did 37 or 38 states um, in the US be it because I worked on national accounts as well and I did a show called Bar Rescue um, I did season yeah. one yeah I did season one to season four I did 12 I think it was 12 episodes 10 or 12 episodes you can have to look those up on YouTube yeah they're cool no no they're taking them down off YouTube oh, no. Spike TV or Viacom took them down because I got all the DVDs before I left he sent me all the DVDs as a gift 
and of course I put them up on YouTube and then about two weeks later they pulled them down <laughs> blocked them <laughs> sorry about that but uh, yeah they're, they're very cool episodes and I had so much fun doing so them so all that travelling takes its toll I guess it did it and you did. wanted to be back home maybe well the, my, unfortunately my father passed away um, around that time and mum was you know I, I had to come home and I wanted to come home it wasn't that I had to I wanted to come home and I got offered I got a phone call um, so I came home for of course my father being sick and then passed away so I spent about a month and a half back home and then when I got back to New Jersey I was in my apartment one day and I got a phone call from uh, the Irish office from Diageo in Ireland <coughs> asking me would I be interested in coming moving back and kicking off and launching world class in Ireland um, and reserve brands so bringing in the likes of Bullet and Don Julio and Zacapa um, so I did and I accepted that and moved back and it was a great role it was brand new it was again the only spirit guy in Ireland so but I'd Previously, I kind of knew everybody, so it was easy enough transition to come back in. And within about six, seven months, I was in St. James Gate one day in the Ashe office in Dublin, and I got, a, an, I got an email asking me to come down to a meeting room, so I did. And I went down, and there was two people in the meeting room, a girl called Georgie Smittick, um, who was innovation at the time, and Charlie Greener, who was the head of innovation for Europe. He's based out in Mexico now. And they sat me down, they're like, what we're going to tell you is highly confidential. We need you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, before even before they even spoke to me. So I was like, right, okay, NDA, fair enough. <laughs> and they basically said, we're developing, or we want to develop a new Irish whiskey. And we want you to part of the team that does it. So basically from concept right through to liquid, we need you to help us develop this. Um, and that was the very first day we called a project Good Luck. That was our name of the project. Um, we called it Project Good Luck, and that was how we kicked it off. So we we had nothing. We didn't even have a name or a concept. Just or you're going to do an Irish whiskey. Yeah. And right. what what's going to make us different compared to any other? That must have been really exciting for you. It was brilliant. It was you know again it, I talk about my journey in life from a lounge boy to where I am now, and I suppose my legacy, the way I look at it, is you know the bartenders over the years that I've helped and I yeah I've helped and I've trained and I've um, brought forward r- right throughout the industry and I still keep in touch with a lot of them um, some of them are Irish some of them are you know I'll give you a great story in a minute about that but for me my legacy is having you know working on something like Rowan Coat that's going to be around and hopefully will be around two three hundred years when I'm six feet under um, and hopefully my name will be somewhere still connected with that you know and um, there was four of us that worked on it and that was it there was myself Georgie Charlie and Caroline Martin who's our master blender so we also brought in five Dublin bartenders into the project down the line probably about a year a year and a bit into it but it was we set out one mission one goal was to create a really cool Irish whiskey that bartenders could pick up and make drinks with and would ho- still hold us flavour and still you know taste really really good um, and that's what we did you know it took us a hell of a lot of prototypes we did it something like over 120 prototypes well how do you know when it's the right one yeah so that that I mean, is how, or how many people <laughs> does it take to know if it's the right one well during that journey um, it was about a year or so into it Susan and, and myself and Caroline so I'd never met Caroline <clears throat> She's a master blender, and she's 40, I think she's 40 years as a master blender, 30 odd, 40 years. She's brilliant, absolutely fantastic. She's based in Scotland, and she used to send me over four or five prototypes out of every batch of 10 or 15 that she would make. She'd pick her four or five that she'd like, and she'd um, send them over, ship them over to Ireland to me. I'd bring them home, or I'd, myself and Georgie would sit in the meeting room in the office and we'd taste them. And this was the, the start. So we had a kind of concept where we wanted to be an Irish whiskey, typical, well, I won't say typical, but a traditional style of Irish whiskey, um, but with more depth and flavour. So bartenders could ho- would hold up well in drinks and bartenders made drinks with it. So that was our concept. Caroline started selecting different whiskies, different casks um, from, from the whiskies I've come from, um, and she started blending. And at the time, we were using pot still, grain, and malt. Um, over the course of probably about six months of back and forth, we decided not to use pot still. Um, we decided just to use grain and malt, and that was kind of Caroline to get the flavor she wanted. That was her decision. So it got to a point after about six, seven months where every batch she was sending over, they tasted good, but the minute we made drinks with it, they oh, just didn't hold up. And that was the kind of thing. It was like, Caroline, these are really good whiskies, but they're not doing what we... want to sip them. Yeah. But it's not, it's not doing what yeah. we want to do. This is not what we set out to do. So she was kind of getting a bit frustrated, um, of course, because this was probably about prototype, I'd say probably in the 50s at this stage. Um, and usually oh a, a blender will do anywhere between 20 and 40 prototypes, and that'll be it. So we were getting way past that, and she was going, well, you have to decide on one. 
and we couldn't so what we decided to do was bring in or ask the actual to bring in five of Dublin's best bartenders oh. and get them to actually give their input so it's not just myself and Georgie feeding back to Caroline now we have five you know, best mixologists, best cocktail bartenders in Ireland, giving their feedback as well. Um, so I picked five of friends, people I've worked with, really top end bartenders in Dublin that I trust. And um, we got them to sign NDAs, and um, from there they start working on a project. And we, you know, they they were a massive impact, but they didn't do, they weren't kind of, they didn't know much about it. I should say, you know, we didn't tell them anything. We right. used to meet with them, give them four or five prototypes, go, what do you think of these? And what we used to do in Seven Georgie is we actually put other liquids. So we might put one of the prototypes from, you know, six months ago into it just to mix it up and get their opinion. And from that, we we figured out three things. We figured out that we 40% ABV was not going to be enough. We needed something stronger um, because when you mix a 40% liquid, it does drop, it dilutes, and, you know, it doesn't hold true. Um, the actual wood that we wanted to use so Caroline was using different few different styles. We knew we needed something that was quite heavy. Um, so that's why we went with all bourbon, ex-bourbon casks, majority being first fill. So when you smell Roland Co, you will get that kind of bourbon style, nose to it and, and flavor. That's because all the whiskey is actually aged in American oak. Um, and then the third thing was that we wanted something, and this was the bartenders, that when they tasted other Irish whiskeys, it was very clean and very, you know, it, it faded away pretty fast, the actual finish on it. Um, and they were like, how can we get a longer finish? How can we get a, a more oilier waxier finish so when we do make mix in the drink it's coating your mouth it's not just clean cut so we, we this was all the information we fed back to caroline and then she decided not to chill filter her whiskey she decided to use 45 percent abv she decided to use whiskies that came from all american oak mm -hmm. so it was the, the kind of input from the bartenders that created the elements that actually made rowan co this so what is it 106 versions uh, later you got it 106 so prototypes <laughs> So what's in the bottle is actually prototype 106. We did over 120, but it was 106. Oh, and that's the one. You asked me how do you know when you when you have to stop or when you stop. Um, it was in the Vintage Cocktail Club. We were all there. Um, there was five of us and uh, myself, Georgie. So it was about seven or eight of us, actually, the five bartenders and, and three of us. And again, we had a four, five, six maybe prototypes, and 106 was one of them. And we just picked it up and we started playing with it and making drinks. And first of all, it was beautiful and neat. Second of all, when you add ice or water, it held true. And then we start making sours, we start making old fashions, we just start making cocktails, and they were all perfect. And Georgie was like, Would you buy this if it was, you know, and we, we all just went, Yeah. And we we're like, Well, this is the one then. You know, you could continue, continue, but there was no point. We had a fantastic liquid at this stage, and we were like, Let's run with this. Let's, and once you have the liquid, then you can build the story you can build it oh see I was going to ask that I was wondering while you were doing that were you also coming up with the story yep. at the same time it was yeah it was like from very start we knew mm -hmm. we needed um, you know a story behind it because we don't we don't have a distillery at the moment so Rowan Co doesn't have a distillery the whiskies that are used inside Rowan Co are selected by Caroline from other distilleries around Ireland now we have blended it we have bottled it all of our own and this is a very common practice not just in Ireland across Scotland across the US you know people buying other whiskies but <clears throat> we wanted something that people could identify with um, both bartender or consumer and it was Georgie actually when she was doing her research um, it was probably a couple of months into it um, that came to us one day we were all in the meeting room and she's like why don't we not honour one of the biggest distilleries that ever existed um, in Ireland, and, and some people say the world, that literally sat right across the road from where we were having our meeting, the old George Road Distillery. Um, and we're like, well, you know, we, we're not making the same liquid as George, because George... Had you heard of him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So George so Road Distillery was, or Thomas Street Distillery was called, um, was the largest distillery in, in Ireland. Um, so he still has a reputation, even though it no absolutely. longer exists. Absolutely. It's... Uh, funny enough he closed he opened or the distillery opened in 1757 it closed around 1926 slash 1927 oh, um, not that long ago really no well, I guess 100 years 100 years roughly or even less than 100 years uh -huh. so there was there was an average of about 2,000 distilleries in Ireland at one stage um, between the early 1920s up to 1930s all of them bar three closed down due to different different um, events that happened in Ireland so our, we were the market leader or the leader of Irish sorry whiskey um, in the world world at one stage and then it just nearly went you know what to say extinct in a way yeah. you know and um, so most people knew or a lot of people in the industry would know or have heard of George Rowe but not many consumers and not many you know people outside of the whiskey world would know about it 
So we dubbed it the greatest story never told um, because it is the greatest story never told. He was, the distillery itself sat in 14 acres in Dublin City in the Liberties. Um, the employee, you know, a few hundred people, um, coopers, you know, distillers, everything. They were doing an average about 2 million gallons. So that's a, a liquid a year. Most distilleries would do probably about 2 million litres a year. They were doing 2 million gallons, which I think is about 10,000 litres. 10 to 12,000, which is a monster, you know, monster distillery. Um, so we wanted to honour that. And the, the kind of, the way we looked at it was the distillery is gone. It's no longer there. And um, there's not much history there behind it. Um, like that's actually out there in the open. So there was only one building that's actually left and it was the old St. Patrick's Tower, which was a windmill that uh, Peter Rowe built back in 1757 when the distillery was first opened and um, it's, it's a massive windmill, it still stands there today it's called St. Patrick's Tower now um, and it's used to grind grain, used for the distillery um, and that sits right there, right across the road from our office in front it's of it. It's looking at you. It's looking at us, yeah, and it's <laughs> iconic, you know I actually, until I was told that it was a windmill I didn't realise it was a windmill and um, like you can see the structure, it looks exactly like a windmill but who would put a windmill in Ireland you know so it was the first windmill uh, sorry first smock windmill in Ireland and it's the largest smock windmill in Europe um, so there's a lot of history behind this and right in front of us is a pear tree and that pear tree is uh, dates back to 1850 and the time around George Rowe because George Rowe was known for his gardens he had apple orchards and pear orchards um, so this was pretty iconic that pear tree is still there and um, it bears fruit every single year and within Irish whiskey a lot of Irish whiskey green apple pear notes are quite typical um, in Rowan Co you get that pear poached pear flavour so it kind of connected with our liquid and our story um, and that's how we, we built this story behind it it was to honour George Rowe we, we always knew we could never say we never wanted to say that we're what George Rowe did because we're not we just wanted to honour that piece of history or piece of uh, the golden era as we dubbed it in, um, in Irish history whiskey but you're going one step further and honouring him even more by yeah. opening a distillery yeah. right? so our distillery is a stone's throw roughly about 150 yards away from the original site um, that the old George Road distillery sits on and our new distillery which will be opened uh, March next year so March 2019 will be um, a single malt distillery producing about half a million to a million litres of liquid every single year and the building that we've taken over is the old Guinness Powerhouse which was built back in 1946 closed down about 16, 17 years ago. So we're re basically rejuvenating that, uh, regenerating that, sorry, into a new distillery. And it's going to be a visitor centre, a state-of-the-art cocktail bar for bartenders to train in. We'll have a blending room. The blending room is going to be called 106 Blending Room, um, where both consumers on the tour and bartenders can come and create their own blend of whiskey on the back of what Caroline did with, um, with Rowan Co. I can't wait to visit it. It's going to be cool. It's but you know really what? Cool. You've made me so thirsty. I have to try some of this. No Should problem. we go make a cocktail? Yeah, yeah. Let's go and have a drink. Thanks to Peter for taking the time to speak with me. After our chat, I was lucky enough to try all of, yes, all of Rowan Co.'s new summer serves. If you are anywhere near New La Bar in London, then head down there to try them. All the bartenders will know them by heart. I also have all the recipes on alushlifemanual.com. Now it's time for our cocktail of the week. Our cocktail of the week is the Rowan Co. Peaches and Cream. Full of flavor, the Peaches and Cream is a peach sour served straight up in a Nick and Nora glass. Add the following ingredients to a shaker. 50 ml of Rowan Co., 30 ml of fresh peach juice, 25 ml of lemon juice, one bar spoon of lavender infused honey, 25 ml of egg whites, then add a pinch of cinnamon and a pinch of chocolate. Shake it and pour it into that Nick and Nora glass. Then garnish with bee pollen, bitters, and a fresh cut flower. If you want to know more about all the different cocktail glasses, please visit alushlifemanual.com, where you'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week, as well as all the ingredients in our shop. If you've liked what you've heard, don't forget to nominate us for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award. You'll find all the details on my site. Next episode, we'll be in the wilds of Northumberland with Valentine Warner, 
who has left the kitchen for a little while to follow the woodland spirits. Come join us then. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast, the sister of A Lush Life Manual. For more information and links to everything you heard, plus a bit more, please visit alushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. The music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra, and I'm your hostess, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar.